for it. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to get to do an international finance seminar. So this is a first time for me. So it's quite exciting. Okay. So the motivation for this paper comes from the fact that the misallocation of inputs like capital and labor plays an important role in explaining differences in productivity and income across countries. But despite the importance of this uh, misallocation for economic development, the literature on misallocation faces two crucial challenges. The first is what I'll call a practical or policy-oriented challenge. And this really comes from the fact that much of the literature tries to quantify the amount of misallocation in the economy using something called a residual approach, where essentially they attribute all of the cross-sectional variation in the marginal revenue products to different inputs, like capital and labor, to misallocation. Now, while this could be useful for quantifying all of the misallocation in the economy, regardless of the sources of misallocation, the challenge is that it doesn't allow you to identify specific policy tools that can be used to reduce misallocation. And so the first question we have is, you know, if you want to go to a finance minister and say, you need to use a policy tool to reduce misallocation, what tool would that be? Can we identify something to tell them? The second challenge has to do with measurement. And so thinking back to what I just said about how we often attribute all the cross-sectional variation and the marginal revenue products of different inputs to misallocation. Well, if we have any uh, measurement error or model misspecification error that allows the that causes the absorbed uh, variation in the marginal revenue returns to different inputs to be bigger than the real variation in the marginal revenue returns to different inputs, then that's going to inflate how much misallocation we think that there is in the economy. And in addition, and if we inflate the amount of misallocation that we think there is in the economy, then it's also going to inflate how much we think aggregate productivity will go up if we were to reduce misallocation. And so this measurement problem is actually quite challenging because it makes it very difficult for us to actually quantify the effects of reducing misallocation, even if we identify that policy that actually can reduce misallocation. So in this paper, we try to make progress on both of these issues. And we do so using the staggered foreign capital liberalization of different disaggregated industries in the Indian manufacturing sector at different times. In terms of the policy problem, we'll show that foreign capital liberalization actually can reduce misallocation. So this gives policymakers a tool that they can use to reduce misallocation. And in fact, there's still quite a lot of uh, restrictions on foreign capital flows in low-income countries. And so this is actually important from a policy point of view. And I'll just mention that this is a very nice setting for thinking about the effects of foreign capital liberalization. Because often when countries liberalize, they liberalize all of their industries at the same time. They may also do lots of other things at the same time as well. And so it's often very hard to identify the effects of foreign capital liberalization from country level changes or other things that are happening at the same time. What's sort of unusual in this setting is that India is actually liberalizing very specific industries at different times. And that's going to let us look at the effects of foreign capital liberalization fixing country level institutions. In terms of the measurement problem, our natural experiment is going to allow us to estimate the relative changes in firms' input wedges on capital and label, uh, controlling for unabsorbed form heterogeneity using form fixed effects. And once we have these estimates, we're going to think about how we can use these form level estimates of the changes in wedges to actually aggregate all difference and differences estimates to get an aggregate effect on treated industries productivity. And so to do that, at the end of this talk, hopefully, if I manage time well, I'll introduce a new methodology to aggregate reduced form estimates of the changes in wedges to get a lower bound effect on treated industries solar residual. So why do we want to focus on capital liberalization? Why do we think that this is important? Well, actually, the role of foreign capital is really ambiguous in low-income countries. On the one hand, we think that imperfect capital markets are very likely to lead to capital misallocation. 
And in particular, in low income countries, those often involve state owned banks. These state owned banks may be inefficiently won, they may be politically captured. Additionally, there may be domestic regulation that actually affects where, firms, uh, where banks can lend money, and that regulation may actually direct money towards places that have lower marginal returns to capital. And so in India, for example, there's often priority sector lending that may not actually be the same sectors that have the highest marginal returns to capital. So foreign capital is not going to be bound by any of these political or regulatory constraints, and it's also not going to be bound by you know, historical path dependence or institutional constraints. And so in that sense, foreign capital liberalization could indeed reduce misallocation, but we can't take that for granted because on the other hand, foreign investors may also be less able to process and monitor soft information in low-income countries. And if that's the case, they may actually allocate capital in a way that increases misallocation rather than reducing it. And so this is going to be a very nice setting for us to actually determine the direction of the effect of foreign capital liberalization on misallocation. So we're going to contribute to three strands of literature. The first is, go and I won't go into a ton of detail because I don't have a ton of time, but the first is going to be a literature on the effects of financial frictions on misallocation. The second is a literature on economic development on the effects of financial frictions on development. And finally, we contribute to the literature on capital account liberalization. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll first tell you about the institutional background in India, and I'll provide you with a very brief conceptual framework that's going to help fix what I mean when I talk about misallocation, and is also going to help generate some very useful predictions for what we should look at in our empirical strategy. And based on that conceptual framework, I'll present you with our empirical strategy and talk to you a little bit about the data we'll use to act for actual estimates. Uh, finally, I'll show you the reduced form results. And in the last part of the talk, I'll talk to you about how we can aggregate those reduced form effects to get an aggregate effect of the policy on treated industries solar residual. So from its independence, India was initially a closed socialist economy. And forward investment was very heavily regulated under the Foreign Exchange Act of 1973. So under this act, and each individual foreign investment required individual approval by the government regulator, uh, which introduces you know, a slow and cumbersome process and some uncertainty. And additionally, foreign ownership was restricted to below 40% of domestic firms' equity. Now, all this changes in 1991 when India suffers a severe balance of payment crisis. And as a result, the government, in conjunction with you know, advice from the IMF and the World Bank, engages in a series of structural reforms. But most relevant from the point of view of this paper is that they engage in the first wave of capital liberalizations at this time. And these affect roughly 40% of firms in the manufacturing industry. And so the way these liberalizations work is that now all uh, foreign investments become automatically approved. So you don't have that individual approval process. And foreign ownership caps get raised to at least 51%. And in some places, they even, in some cases, they even go up higher. Now, at the same time, a bunch of other things that are pretty important happen as well. So trade gets liberalized, the uh, tariffs are reduced, and this has been well studied by Penelope Goldberg, Petya uh, Tabalova, Amit Kandawal, and co-authors. Uh, and at the same time, the license laws, which determined where different goods could be manufactured within India, also gets dismantled, which has been studied by Philippe Aguiana and co-authors. So in 1991, there's a lot going on. And so we're actually not going to focus on the liberalizations that took place in 1991, because it would be so difficult to isolate the effects of capital liberalization from all these other things that are happening with other reforms and with the macro economy overall. Instead, we collected data on two subsequent waves of liberalizations that occurred without these large macroeconomic shocks in 2001 and 2006 in the manufacturing sector. 
And so to get this data, we basically went lots of releases of the Handbook of Industrial Policy and Statistics, which is put out by uh, the regulator. And uh, we were able to code up at the five digit industry level, which industries get liberalized. Uh, and so these liberalizations are going to look really similar to the liberalizations that we just saw in 1991. Again, we're going to have automatic approval of full and equity instead of requiring each individual investment to be individually approved. And we're going to have the caps being raised to at least 51% on full and equity and sometimes higher. And so these subsequent liberalizations are much smaller. In our data, they affect about 9% of manufacturing firms. And so this is just to give you an idea of what these liberalizations are and also some insight into exactly how uh, disaggregated these five digit categories really are, they're very specific. But you can see that the liberalizations are actually affecting kind of a wide range of industries, going from pharmaceuticals to rubber and chemical manufacturing to uh, tobacco. So this is basically going to be the variation that we're going to use in our regressions. So before we get to the empirical strategy though, I want to present you with this brief conceptual framework to help fix ideas about what we mean when we say misallocation. So like much of the literature, we're going to model misallocation as wedges on what a firm pays for inputs. So you can think about a firm I buying capital, label, and materials. And each of these inputs has a market price, Px, but a firm is not going to just pay Px, they're going to pay Px times uh, one plus that firm input specific wedge, tau Ix. And so if there's no misallocation, all the firms are paying the same price for an input, these tau Ixs would just be zero. So now that we have this cost of inputs, we can write down a single product firm's profit function. And so we have that profit is just going to be equal to revenues, which is just the price for output times the quantity produced, given the amount of inputs uh, consumed, minus the cost of the inputs, which is going to depend on the firm input specific tabs. So from this profit function, we can take the first order condition with respect to the consumption of each input Xi. And we get that for the form to be profit maximizing, it must be that it's setting the marginal revenue returns of, on an input equal to the marginal cost of that input, which in this case is the cost of the input. And so what we can see, even though this is a very simple relationship, is that the marginal revenue returns for an input are gonna be proportional to the firm's wedges for that input. And that's actually gonna help us a lot in our vehicle analysis. And so this is going to allow us to identify pre-treatment, which firms seem to have high wedges. Because if we see that a firm pre-treatment has a high marginal revenue return to capital, then that tells us that that's a firm with a high wedge. Then what happens when this allocation goes down well, misallocation is going down if a firm that ex ante had a high wedge experiences a reduction in its wedge due to the policy. And what should that look like in our data? Well, it should look like a firm that ex ante had a high marginal revenue product of capital experiencing a reduction in its marginal revenue product of capital due to the policy. And so this gives us a prediction about the heterogeneous effects of the policy on different forms within treated industries. It tells us that if mass allocation is going down, we should see MLPK fall for the ex-ante high MLPK falls. In addition, because the cost of capital will be going down for these forms, we should see that capital usage should increase for the ex-ante high MLPK forms as a result of the policy if mass allocation goes down. Okay, so with this in mind, we can now take this to our empirical strategy and the data. So to uh, for our analysis, we're going to use the Prowess CMI B data set, which has already been broadly used looking to look at trade liberalization in this data, uh, sorry, in, in this context. And the data contains about 67,000 form year observations. It includes all of the publicly traded forms in India, 
And it also includes quite a wild swath of the private forms as well. So you can think about it as capturing kind of the large and medium-sized forms. The data account for more than 70% of India's economic activity and 75% of corporate tax revenue. So while this is not the universe of forms, we think we're capturing a really important part of the Indian economy. An advantage of this data uh, set relative to other data sets is that it's going to give us a form level panel so that we can actually control for form fixed effects. Using this data, we're gonna focus on the period between 1995 and 2015. And we're gonna do this for two reasons. First, as I mentioned before, we don't really wanna look at the 1991 reforms because a lot is happening at the same time. And so by restricting to post-1995, we're restricting to after that first major reform episode. In addition, while Plowers dates back to 1989, coverage of the database really starts to stabilize in 1995. So between 1989 and 1995, coverage is kind of steadily increasing. And so we don't want to have any differential entry of forms into the data set affecting our results. So just to give you a sense of the data, uh, as I mentioned before, about 9% of forms in this data set are going to be treated in either 2001 or 2006. The modal form in the data is a private domestic form. So even though this contains the universe of public forms, you should still think of the majority of forms in the data as domestic. And interestingly, from the point of view of thinking about misallocation in a low income country, we often think about there being big state-owned forms and this being an important driver of misallocation. In fact, only about 4% of the forms in our data are going to be state-owned. So being a state-owned form is not really gonna be a big part of the story. In addition, these forms are pretty big. And so the average form in the data uh, is going to have uh, gross fixed assets of $23 million. Okay. So now that we've introduced the data, we can think about what our key empirical specification is going to be. And so essentially throughout this paper, we're going to be estimating difference in difference regressions with heterogeneous effects. And so here we're regressing our outcomes, which include capital and module revenue product of capital, just like in the conceptual framework, on an indicator variable at the industry yield level for being in a treated industry after treatment has taken place. And the interaction between that indicator variable for being in a treated industry would being a form that during the pre-treatment period had a high marginal revenue product of capital. So capturing that this was a form in the pre-treatment period that had a high wedge. Then we're going to control for form fixed effects and yield fixed effects. So this is going to account for any form specific measurement there or any form specific heterogeneity. It's as long as it's time invariant. It's also going to account for any, and the uh, yield fixed effects are gonna account for anything that could be happening in the macro economy. We we'll also have uh, varying additional sets of controls, which can include form age uh, fixed effects uh, in our more parsimonious specifications. We also include form pre-treatment size quartile by yield fixed effects to account for differential time trends by form size. And we can go so far as to include industry by yield fixed effects to account for industry, different industry level time trends. So we'll code high MLPK as being one, if a form's average MLPK in the pretreatment period from 1995 to 2000 was greater than the four digit industry median. And I promise I'll tell you in one slide uh, how we actually measure MLPK. But I want to point out two things about identification in this regression. This looks like a pretty standard difference in differences regression, but actually in terms of determining level misallocation went down, this regression has weaker assumptions than a standard difference in differences regression. And this is coming from the fact that to see if misallocation goes down, what we really care about is beta two. Because our prediction is that if misallocation goes down, we should see that MLPK is gonna go down differentially for the ex ante high MLPK forms. And since we really care about beta two for this prediction, we actually have an additional source of variation. We have our year and industry variation, like a standard difference in differences, but we also have form level variation. 
And so, in fact, in a, our most conservative specifications, we can very non-parametrically control for industry by year time trends or industry by year policy changes by including five digit industry by year fixed effects. That's going to subsume beta one because it'll be collinear with the reform, but it's actually going to still allow us to identify beta two. On the other hand, even though we don't uh, need the pair, we actually don't need parallel trends between the treated and untreated industries to identify beta two because we can fully control for industry level trends with the five digit industry by year fixed effects. When we actually go to get the aggregate effects of the policy, we're going to need to be able to estimate beta one as well. And so from the point of view of our aggregation exercise, even though we don't need this assumption to test if misallocation went down, we are going to need this to get the aggregate effects of the policy. And so we are, it is going to be very important to test the parallel trends assumption between treated and untreated firms. And so we're going to validate that with an event study graph. So as I promised, uh, I'm going to tell you now about our method to get MLPK. So basically throughout, we're going to assume a Cobb-Douglas revenue production function. And uh, under the Cobb-Douglas, and so here A is going to be TFPR. Uh, because this is a revenue production function. And under the Cobb-Douglas revenue production function, uh, MLPK is going to be equal to uh, just the alpha on capital times sale revenues over capital. Now, if we're willing to assume that the alpha on capital is the same for all of the firms in a full-digit industry, that's going to mean that MLPK is going to be proportional to revenues over capital within a full-digit industry. And so we can just use revenues over capital as our proxy for MLPK. Okay. So with this in mind, we can now go to our uh, reduced form effects. So first, we're going to start out by testing that parallel trends assumption and estimating the average effects of the policy. And so to estimate the average effects of the policy, we just want that same regression I showed you, but without including the interaction between being a high MLPK form and being in a treated industry. So we find when we estimate these average effects that capital increases for treated industries on average by 30%, which is quite a large effect. Furthermore, to evaluate uh, the parallel trends assumption, we plot the event study graph for the average effect of the policy on treated industries. And so here, our x-axis is normalized so that zero is the year of the report. And you can think about one as being one year after the reform, two being two years after the reform, and so on. And so each of these coefficients is the effect of being in a treated industry by year after or before the reform. So if uh, we have parallel pre-trends, what we should expect to see is that prior to the reform, there's no differential effect of being in a treated industry on firms' capital. And indeed, that is what we see. So prior to the reform, treated capital doesn't evolve any differently for firms in the treated industries relative to the untreated industries. On the other hand, after the reform, we see that capital consumption increases quite steadily in the treated industries before leveling out about five years later. And so consistent with this, the large estimated increase in capital in treated industries is the difference in differences regressions. So now that we've validated this parallel pre-trends assumption, let's actually go to our main heterogeneous effects regression. And so now that we uh, disaggregate the effects by level forms had high MLPK or not pre-reform, we see that really all of the effects are concentrated in the forms that had high MLPK pre-reform. So forms that had high MLPK experienced about 20% increases in the revenues. The forms that had low MLPK don't really see anything happen with the revenues. For uh, looking at capital, we see that that 30% on average increase in capital for treated industries is actually masking the fact that for high MLPK forms, capital increased by about 60%, but for low MLPK forms, really nothing happened. We also see that there's evidence that there's complementarity between firms' demand for capital and labor. So for these ex-ante high MLPK firms, they also increased their wage bill by about 
And finally, looking at our key measure for misallocation, MLPK, we see that for the XAD high MLPK firms, their MLPK falls by 41%. On the other hand, for the XAD low MLPK firms, not much is going on. And uh, by the way, I should tell you that free treatment, the difference between high and low MLPK firms, MLPK is on the order of 150%. So this is substantially helping to close the gap, but it's not, you know, closing it all the way or overshooting the gap. Now, while I've provided you with evidence that the parallel trends assumption makes sense when we look across industries, here we actually want to test whether those differential trends for high MLPK forms in treated industries. And so this is a very similar event study graph, but here I've now plotted the effect of being a high MLPK form in a treated industry by year around the reform. And so this is showing our most parsimonious specification, which only controls for form and year fixed effects. And so like in the uh, graph for the average effects, you see that prior to the reform, there's no differential effect of being a high MLPK form in a treated industry. So it looks like our pre-trends are parallel, but following the reform, capital consumption really increases differentially for the high MLBK forms in the treated industries before leveling out by, uh, around five years later. Now we can check whether these relationships look similar when we put in additional controls. So we can add controls for size, uh, quartile fixed effects during the free treatment period, interacted with yield to account for any differential trends by form size. And when we do that, you see that the relationships are almost exactly identical. We can add in form age fixed effects as well. Again, the relationship is almost exactly identical. And in our most conservative specification, as I alluded to earlier, we can allow for five digit industry by year fixed effects to sort of very non-parametrically account for any industry specific time trends. And again, our results are very similar. Looking at MLPK, our key outcome for misallocation, we again see much the same thing. There's not any evidence of a negative pre-trend and following the policy, MLPK reduces, uh, falls precipitously. So in the paper, we do lots of additional robustness tests and I won't go through all of them in too much detail. But I will mention uh, one that has to do with mean revulsion in a little bit more detail because I think that mean revulsion is an important threat for us because you might think, well, your main outcome is MLPK and you're looking at forms that XAD had a high MLPK. So don't we just expect MLPK to fall for those XAD high MLPK forms once we're not using the MLPK to denote them high MLPK anymore? But what's nice about this is we actually have two reforms, one in 2001 and one in 2006. So we can actually just look at the 2006 reform and exclude the 2001 reform. When we look at the 2006 reform, the whole, all of the five years prior to the reform also are not being used to construct who's high or low MLPK. And so this is all just mean revulsion. We should actually see the decline in MLPK kick in five years before the reform, not at the time of the reform. And in fact, we don't see that at all. Even if we exclude the 2001 reform, we see almost identical results when we just look at the 2006 reform. And I think this really rules out the possibility that mean revulsion could be driving the results. I'll tell you very briefly that we could also deal with differential attrition by restricting to a balanced panel of forms. This reduces our sample size by quite a bit but the qualitative effects we estimate are very similar. And we can also look at probe exit and entry as outcomes with the caveat that we can only see if you exit or enter the prowess data set, not if you actually exit uh, in real life. And we also don't see any effects of the policy on exit or entry. We could also Windsorize outliers for our outcome variables to make sure that our results are not going to be really affected by outliers. And you can see that when we visualize the outliers, we get almost identical estimates to what we got when we did do visualizing. So in particular, our estimate for the reduction in MLPK 
it goes from minus 0.41 to minus 0.42. So it really looks like outliers are not having much effect on our estimates. We also show in the table that the results are robust to a series of controls, including, as you probably figured from the event study graphs, controlling for five-digit industry by yield fixed effects, controlling and also controlling for input-output spillovers to untreated industries, controlling for changes to tariffs over time, controlling for changes to reservation policies, which sort of affected um, and who, uh, priorities about who uh, capital should flow to domestically, and uh, changes to those. And we can also control for state yield fixed effects to account for any changing state policies over time. So the next set of results I want to show you looks at product level effects instead of form level effects. And so a nice kind of unique feature about Flowers is that it also has forms product level prices and outputs measured in quantities. And so we can examine whether we see the same pattern for prices and outputs as we saw for these other form level outcomes. And we're essentially going to estimate the same regression we did before but because, but because now an observation is at the product uh, yield uh, form level, we're going to include product by form fixed effects and make within product comparisons between XAP high and low MLBK forms. Now, I think prices are a particularly interesting outcome to think about in this context because those are several reasons we might expect that XAP high MLPK forms will reduce the prices. So first, uh, if the wedges for these forms that XAP had high wedges went down, this means they have lower marginal costs. And so if there's any pass through of marginal costs onto consumers, we might expect to see lower prices. Additionally, if forms are just getting bigger and output is going up, there could be a competition effect going on, which reduces prices by reducing forms markups. So looking at the results, we see on average, there's a uh, 4% but insignificant reduction in prices. But when we look at what's happening with the high and the low MLPK forms, we see that actually for the high MLPK forms, prices are falling by 7%. And for the low MLPK forms, very little is happening. When we turn to output, we see very similar effects to what we saw for revenues. On average, there's an insignificant 12% increase in output at the product level. But when we look at this for high MLPK versus low MLPK forms, we see that output is increasing by 20% for the high MLPK forms. So very similar to what we saw with revenues. So the last reduced form result I want to show you has to do with heterogeneity by local financial development. So we were interested in the idea that Foreign capital could be particularly helpful for reducing misallocation when you don't have a well-developed banking sector that can efficiently allocate capital. And India is actually quite good context to look at this because there's a lot of heterogeneity at, at the state level in the development of the banking sector. And so we assembled state level data on average bank credit from 1995 to 2000. And uh, we then are going to get a measure of state level financial development, which is just a log of all bank credit during this pre-treatment period. This is gonna allow us to estimate heterogeneous effects uh, but using a tri triple differences by local, bank uh, local state level financial development. So this is our key regression. And uh, what you can see is that in the states that were more financially developed, ex ante, the reform has much smaller effects on ex ante high MLPK forms. So essentially eliminates the revenue effect. Uh, you have much smaller effects on revenue, much smaller effects on capital, much smaller effects on wages, and MLPK decreases less in these more financially developed states. Now it's hard to interpret uh, point estimates for triple differences regressions. So let me tell you a little bit about what this means in terms of magnitudes. So for a state that's at the 25th percentile in terms of its local financial development, uh, for an ex ante high MLPK form in a treated industry, MLPK is going to fall by almost 
for a state that's at the 75th percentile in its fin in financial development, so much more financially developed state. MLPK uh, for the XMP high MLPK form only falls by 28%. So it looks like the reform is having much larger effects in these less financially developed states on the order of 20 percentage point difference in the effect sizes. So in the paper, we have uh, two additional reduced form results. Uh, and I won't get into too much detail on these in the interest of time, because I think I'm on time, but not, not going to be ahead of time right now. So because we have this uh, product level output data, we can actually estimate form level TFPQ, uh, which is you know, a measure of form productivity, uh, and using production function estimation. And so we can put that as an outcome in our regressions, and we don't find any statistically significant effects on this measure of form level TFPQ. And so it looks like in, the, in our context, most of the action is really coming from the allocation of inputs as opposed to changes in form level productivity. We also can look at label misallocation in the same way we look at capital misallocation. And so we want a very anal analogous regression well, instead of using variation coming from being high marginal revenue product of capital, we use variation coming from having a high marginal revenue product of label. And when we do that, we also find evidence that for the exit, the high MLPL forms, MLPL goes down. So it looks like label misallocation is also going down, although less so than capital misallocation. And I want to emphasize that this is not such a surprising result because there's lots of reasons we might think that financial afflictions could lead to label misallocation. For example, those hiring and filing costs. So, you know, if I hire somebody today, it's not so easy to get rid of him tomorrow um, if I run into financial constraints tomorrow. Additionally, it could be a timing issue where I can't pay people with the output they're going to produce when I hire them. And so again, you could run into financial uh, constraints for, uh, getting the sort of the light amount of label. So in my last, um, I think I have 10 minutes left. I'm gonna plan like I have 10 minutes left. So in my last uh, 10 minutes, I'm now going to talk to you about how we take these reduced form estimates and get the aggregate effects. So basically to get these aggregate effects, we have a two-step plan and I've already shown you step one of the plan. So in step one, we used our reduced form uh, uh, estimates to get the relative changes in forms, wedges, and inputs. And I already showed you, and this is going to be pretty important later, that we're getting these changes in forms, wedges, and inputs without much bias coming from measurement error. But now that we have this, we want to estimate how this is actually going to affect the aggregate productivity of treated industries. And this takes us to step two, but we now have to build an aggregator. And so we're going to rely on a first order approximation for how changing inputs change the solar residual of treated industries that comes from Petron and Levinson and Bakahi and Fawley. And uh, we're very much indebted to Bakahi and Fawley for conversations about this paper. Uh, and so this aggregator is going to allow us to bound the aggregate effect of the policy under assumptions that are um, less strong than people often use when they use structural models to get aggregate effects. And so we're going to show basically how you can leverage difference and difference estimates to get a well-bound measure of the effect of a policy of the solar residual. And so this is the first total approximation we're going to use. And so it's basically telling us that the change in the solar residual for a group of, for a uh, group of forms big I is going to be given by summing over, taking a weighted average of the changes in the forms uh, total factors of productivity. Uh, so this is kind of a technical efficiency term, plus an effect coming from changes in inputs that's going to sum over the changes for each form's I's inputs, and for each input, capital, label, and materials, but it's going to weight the changes in inputs by the Axia the wedge for the form for that input by the output elasticity for that form for that input 
and by the firm's uh, sales as a share of ICE net output. And so this is a pretty general formulation. Nothing here is going to assume constant returns to scale. It's not going to assume any specific aggregator, so we don't have to make any assumptions about elasticities of substitution. And it doesn't assume any specific input-output structure. In practice, we are going to assume Cobb-Douglas production functions, but we're going to do that for estimation purposes. You actually don't need that for this uh, expression. So looking at this expression, several components are actually pretty straightforward to identify based on what we already know from the data. So first, I told you, although I didn't show you, that TFPQ doesn't change as a result of the policy. So we can set change of log A equal to zero, and this technical efficiency term is going to just drop out, and all we're gonna be left with is the changes in the solar residual coming from changes to inputs. Now, what about lambda? Well, lambda is just going to be, we can just calculate lambda using the fact that we see foam sales. We see the total sales for the treated, uh, set of treated foams, and we see each foam's individual sales, and we can turn this into net output by using information that we can construct on input output using the Indian annual survey of industries. We can get our alpha by estimating the production function. And so here's where assuming Cobb Douglas production functions is going to be helpful. In practice, we'll just use Levinson Petron, which is kind of the work pulse production function estimation uh, methodology, but other methods could be used here as well. And uh, to get our change in X's, well, we already actually estimated how the policy affected uh, forms inputs using our differences and differences with heterogeneous effects. So we can actually just predict this based on our estimates under the standard difference and differences assumption that the treated being, that untreated industries were not affected by the policy. So this leaves us with one problem, which is how to estimate the wedges with minimal measurement error. And so, uh, I want to, you to note that if you have a lot of measurement error on these wedges, this could actually really inflate your measure of the soil residual using this, uh, using this full soil approximation. And the reason for that is remember that I've shown you that for forms that X at the end high wedges, inputs are going up. So if you, so we know we're going to have for these X at the high wedge forms a positive value for the change in X, that's going to be multiplied by the wedge. So if we have anything that inflates these wedges like measurement error or model misspecification error, that's going to be multiplied by that change in inputs, and that's also going to inflate or measure the change in the solar residual. And so this might be a concern if we use kind of a standard cross-sectional approach, where we measured wedges just using cross-sectional variation and the marginal revenue products of capital or the marginal revenue products of label, we might worry that then idiosyncratic measurement error is going to lead to some really big wedges, that's then going to lead to some really big values for the solar residual. So instead, we're going to try and put a lower bound on tau. And to do that, we're going to make the assumption that the policy didn't subsidize treated forms. And so what this means is basically you don't overshoot. You don't go from having a positive wedge pre-treatment to a negative wedge uh, after the treatment. The policy at best just eliminates all misallocation. You don't go back to having more misallocation because now you're subsidizing the form. And so mathematically, this is just saying that the wedge post policy has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now this is pretty simple, but it actually is really helpful because then we can write down the expression for the minimal pos minimum possible wedge. So notice that the post treatment wedge is just gonna be equal to the pre-treatment wedge plus the change in the wedge. Well, the minimum post-treatment wedge is zero, so the minimum pre-treatment wedge has to be equal in magnitude to the change in the wedge, right? And we, I just told you, looking at this expression, that because uh, this is going to be increasing in tau, if we can put a minimum, if we can get a minimum value for tau, we can get a minimum value for the solar residual change in the solar residual. Well, if we're looking at changes in wedges, now we're in luck because, well, difference and differences strategy didn't 
identify the level of the wedge, it actually did identify full level changes in the wedges. And so now, just like we estimate changes in inputs using the difference in differences with heterogeneous effects, we can, sorry, uh, I didn't move enough and the lights went out. We can now estimate the difference in differences with heterogeneous effects, putting the wedges as the outcome. Okay, so this is just going to be our estimation equation. So, and here I'm gonna give you the example of estimating the change in our wedge for capital. And so we're just going to regress log MLPK on the reform. It's going to look very similar to the regressions I showed you before, but now we're going to allow the reform to have heterogeneous effects by both for both XAP high MLPK uh, forms and XAP high MLPL forms. Then once we look on this regression, we can use our values of beta to predict what the uh, wedge would be for a form given it's in a treated industry, given whether it was high MLPK or high MLPL prior to the reform. And so notice here, we're not going to be saying the wedges are the same for all forms in, in an industry. This, these heterogeneous effects are going to lead to variation across forms within an industry and the size of their predicted wedge. Okay, and so this is in practice, the estimates we're going to be using uh, for our first order approximation. And you can see that the story is very similar to what we saw before with the more parsimonious regressions where for high MLPK forms, capital is going up a lot and MLPL is falling. Okay, so altogether, this gives us a lower bound estimate for the increase in the solar residual uh, for the treated industries of 5.8%. So even though this is a lower bound, this is a pretty economically meaningful effect. We can also contrast this effect with what we would get if we attributed all of the uh, cross-sectional variation in the module revenue product of capital and the module revenue product of labor to uh, misallocation. And so if we attributed all the cross-sectional variation, we would get an increase in the solar residual on the order of 38%, which is, you know, fairly big. Um, you can think about this as kind of giving us an upper bound of the policy effect. If we try to count for measurement error using a standard collection, like windsorizing the top and bottom 10% of the marginal revenue product of capital and the marginal revenue product of label, you can get an increase in the solar residual of 13%. So, you know, it seems like this met, when you use this cross sectional variation, you're going to get estimates that are very sensitive to outliers and measurement error. So you can think about what we're doing with the low bound approach and the natural experiment is it's really going to discipline our estimates so that to get a low bound that's really not going to be affected by measurement error. So to conclude from a policy point of view, we show that forward capital liberalization can play an important role in reducing capital misallocation. We show that the policy increased capital for ex ante high MLPK forms. And that was particularly true in the states of the less developed banking sectors. And so it seems like um, uh, forward capital liberalization could help substitute for having a more efficient domestic banking sector. From a methodological point of view, we ex show how you could exploit a natural experiment to identify the aggregate effects of the policy on a proxy for aggregate productivity. And in all contexts, even at a lower bound, the reform had meaningful effects on aggregate productivity, increasing it by roughly at least 6%. Um, but on the other hand, when you don't use the natural experiment to discipline your estimates the wedges, you can get very widely varying uh, estimates of the aggregate effects of the policy, depending on how you try to deal with measurement error, you know, the estimates that range from 10 to 40%. Okay, so I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, so now we're opening it up for a Q&A discussion. Um, and just to get started, I thought I'd ask a question sort of about how this paper fits into the literature and thinking about foreign capital. So, you know, we usually think that foreign capital tends to go to large firms with low uh, MR, uh, MRPK. And so is this 
indicating something about the nature of the policy itself that you know foreign investors somehow end mm -hmm. up being better informed and know how to target these firms like in what way does the policy actually work um mm -hmm. you know uh, on the ground such that yeah. uh, you get these aggregate effects Right, and I think you're referencing uh, Gita Gopinath and co author's paper as well, where they sort of show that greater uh, foreign cap uh, financial flows uh, increase misallocation in Europe. Uh, so I think uh, there's probably a couple of things that differ in our context. Uh, I think one thing is that this policy is really only affecting equity. And so I'm not aware of actually any results that look specifically at liberalizing equity and misallocation. So it's not clear how comparable these results are to what already exists in the literature. I think also thinking, you have to think about India as a very different context than a more developed country, right? And so it could be that in a European country, the banking sector is already very efficient. Maybe foreign capital really has nothing to add here. Uh, on the other hand, India's so, uh, banking sector is sort of infamously inefficient. Uh, in an earlier version of these slides, they had a quote from Ann Krugel when she was the uh, acting deputy director of the IMF, and she basically says, everybody knows India's uh, banking system is incredibly inefficient. If we could find a way to make it efficient, it would really unlock economic growth. So I think it's also just a context where capital markets are likely to be particularly imperfect. I think we have to be, so I think that helps reconcile why you might get different effects in different contexts. Uh, I think we also have to be a little bit careful in the sense that we can absorb firms' capital, but we can't actually absorb where that capital is coming from. So we know the policy increased um, capital, but we don't know, you know, whether this new capital actually came from foreign investors. So I think, you know, I think the most reasonable and likely explanation is that it did, but you could also think that might be a story with those equilibrium effects going on where we just have put more capital into India and now it's kind of getting allocated in a better way. Okay. Awesome. Thank you uh, for that response. Um, I actually I actually also had a follow-up question to the main baseline result of mm -hmm. you know uh, raising aggregate productivity by about six percent. So should we think of this as like a one-time result like it's, uh, you know, the reform came in, it's raised productivity by 6%, and that's just where we are? Or do you mm -hmm. expect there to be sort of compound effects over time mm -hmm. for any, um, any reason? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So I think if we look at the, and you know, so we're doing this almost in a very simple way. If you look at the, so I'm just trying to get back to the event study graphs, mm -hmm. here we go. So if you look at the event study graphs, you sort of see that the effects take kind of five years to realize. And so I think the time, you know, the full effects, so, and maybe even there's a little bit of a positive effect going out even longer. And so I think it does tell you that the time frame you're looking at is going to uh, have some effect on what you think the aggregate effects are. If you just looked one year after the policy, you would think that the aggregate effects are going to be a bit smaller, or quite a bit smaller. What we're doing is essentially we're taking kind of the average, right, when we want the difference in differences. And so that may even be, in a sense, pushing down what we find, because we know that by uh, five years out, we can have even kind of bigger effects on capital and MLBK. Ah, uh, okay, okay. And sorry, so, and why was it that you guys were taking the average? Well, I just mean that we're using the difference in differences estimates. And so intuitively, that's taking kind of the average of these effects by year. In practice, you know, so I think we do this because this is kind of a straightforward thing to do. It also ties our hands a bit, like right? you can't go specification searching for the biggest possible effect. Um, but, you know, in practice, you could also imagine estimating these effects year by year and trying to get kind of a long-term effect that's taking account these bigger effects way out. Right, right. Can I ask a um, follow-up question? Um, yeah. Um, hi, Natalie. This is uh, Hanno. I, I, I have a question about um, uh, publicly traded firms. So, so there's obviously quite a few publicly traded firms in your uh, sample, mm -hmm. right? So have you, have you thought about just sort of as a plausibility check looking at the uh, response of uh, the, the stock market valuation of these high MRP firms? Mm -hmm. 
uh, comparing that to the stock market valuation of the low MRPK mm -hmm. firms, uh, because obviously stock market investors ought to be sort of capitalizing uh, these mm -hmm. effects in the stock price. And, and mm -hmm. um, it, it would be kind of a nice sort of plausibility check uh, right. for, for some of these results. And I, I, I imagine the effect ought to be big um, mm. because you're, you're finding fairly large effects on, on uh, these wedges. Thank yeah. You. No, that's a great idea. We haven't done that, but we could definitely do it. Yeah. Um, that, that would be an interesting thing. Uh, to look at, of course, partly would depend on, on sort of uh, other issues uh, related to, to, to how efficient the stock market is in, in, uh, in these particular uh, countries. But uh, yeah. yeah, and, and I think, uh, unfortunately, we're getting a sense from this paper that the Indian stock market may not be super efficient. Yeah, right. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a question from Constantine. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, unmute him and let him ask his question. Uh, Constantine, if you're ready to ask. Yeah, yes, thank you. So I, uh, it sounded like uh, your treatment increases the total amount of capital in India, yes. right? Because foreign capital comes in. So I, I just wanted to ask uh, which part of your main like 6% result is due to reduced misallocation and which part mm -hmm. is due to more inputs, more capital? Yeah, so if we look at, sorry, let me get the first total. So in the solo uh, residual, it's try, it, the way the solo residual works, right, it, it does subtract out inputs using, uh, you know, but there is some question of like when you're misallocation, if, what the right shadow price of those inputs are. But in principle, the solo residual is trying to net out changes in inputs. Um, so if you look at this um, relationship here, actually, if you don't have any misallocation, uh, your tails are zero and inputs go up, you're not going to get any effect on the solar residual. So it's, it's, you know, you need the misallocation. Inputs the world cannot do it. All right, thank you. So ju just to, to uh, go back uh, on constant question, because I think that there are some like, and this is a, a question we often have, and there is some uh, probably mm -hmm. some confusion. Uh, another way to think about it, uh, like Natalie said, and you do need the misallocation. So it is the case that um, one way you could think of misalloc misallocation is just that you know, all say you know, all the capital uh, from low uh, from low NAPK firms is being relocated to high NAPK firms. So this is not what we see here. We do see, like you pointed out, Constantine, that we do see that there is an overall increase in the amount of capital. Yeah. The thing that is crucial is that this additional capital is going differentially more towards high NAPK firm ex ante. So yeah. this is in the sense that there is uh, a reduction in misallocation, even though there is not necessarily a, decla a reduction in the size uh, of exactly. low NAPK firm yeah. ex ante. There's a reduction in misallocation, but it's not coming from reallocation. Yes, exactly. And actually, if we had more reallocation, we'd have bigger effects because if we had forms that had negative tails and we had negative changes in X, we'd actually get bigger effects on the solar residual. Um, I actually uh, also had a question about how the aggregation was done in terms of, mm -hmm. so 9% of the firms are treated. So this 6% mm -hmm. number is coming from scaling that 9%, like you're sort of mm -hmm. doing an experiment where you're scaling that 9% treatment to the whole economy? Or no, so we could do, uh, what we're doing here is we're just estimating the solar residual for the treated firms. So this is like, you can think about the set of treated industries what is the sole residual for the treated industries? And so I here is just a set of forms in treated industries. So we're just like not including the untreated industries right now. Uh, so it would be a very different, this is kind of the exercise here is what was the effect of the of, uh, approximation of what was the effect of the policy. A different exercise that you could do that often people try and do use a structural model for, uh, but 
would be what is the effect if we scaled up the whole policy to the whole economy. Uh, so that okay. that is not the exercise that we're doing here. I see. Okay. Um, great. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. 